Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the live stream of Studium Generale Eindhoven. Welcome to this extra program organized in light of the terrible war going on in Ukraine. Uh, now, of course, every day uh, online uh, on television, you can find a lot of information about this situation wherever you look for it. Um, but at Studium Generale, we felt it was important to do something too for the TUE community. Um, and specifically because there's a lot of attention, of course, for all the ongoing events, um, but perhaps a little less um, about the historical background of the crisis. Um, and trying to understand um, where this war is coming from, um, we would like to take a step back today and discuss the historical backgrounds and events that led up to where we are now. Uh, and we do this with an expert on Russian history, uh, Professor Hans van Koningsbrugge. We're very glad that he can join us today in this live stream. Um, he is Professor of the History and Politics of Russia, in particular Dutch-Russian relationships uh, at the University of Groningen, uh, where he's also Director of the Center for Russian Studies and Director of the Netherlands Russian Center. Hans, uh, a very warm welcome. Uh, we're very uh, glad that you were able to find the time for us today. Um, how has your life changed in the past, say, five weeks? Well, it's more or less, uh, well, everything is decided for me. That's my feeling at this moment. It's running, running, running. And of course, uh, as a professor, you have your own tasks, which are uh, uh, heavy in normal times, but now they are extra heavy. But no problem. I, I can take it. You have to combine your, your normal obligations with uh, also addressing this whole crisis uh, and exactly. explaining it to the nation. Yeah, and radio, newspapers, TV, etc., etc. But it's okay. We will survive. Okay. My staff and I. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, I already mentioned to you, but let me also mention to the viewers at home that um, you're very welcome today to contribute any questions you have in the chat. Um, we've also already received quite some questions of students beforehand. And we will try and incorporate uh, as many of those as we can today. Um, Hans, because I mentioned we would like to uh, take a look at the origins of, of this uh, crisis. Uh, I'm tempted to say, where where do we begin? Yeah, that's a difficult question. We can, of course, start in the ninth century about Kievan Rus, the first Russian state, which, as the name already says, was uh, situated in Ukraine. In the ninth, ninth century. In say. the ninth century and, and okay. afterwards until the 13th century. And that's, a, a, well, a, a common ground for Russian and uh, Ukrainian history. And uh, also a common ground for endless quarrels. Uh, because Putin says it's, it's our heritage and Ukraine says it's our heritage. And both are, uh, well, probably right, of course. Well, that's one part. Another mm -hmm. part is that Ukraine was always, uh, no, until the 17th, 18th century, for most part, part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, so, uh, Polish-Lithuanian territory. Okay. Afterwards, after the, uh, well, after the partition of Poland in the 18th century, uh, the whole territory of Ukraine, except the Western part, which became part of the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy, Mm -hmm. But the rest became part of Russia. And therefore, you see in, in these days the difference between Western Ukraine, where there was a totally different political culture, and Eastern Ukraine, where there was basically Russification. And then uh, during so uh, uh, Soviet times, of course, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, except the Western part, uh, now also the Western part, with, with partly Polish, and after the Second World War, annexed by the Soviet Union. And uh, during Stalinistic times, there was, of course, an, uh, a horrible famine in uh, Ukraine, the Holodomor, which is also a, 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 a great argument between Russian and uh, Ukrainian historians. Okay. But, basi but basically, uh, what happened was that after 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, all the different republics of the Soviet Union became independent. And the deal was, we are not quarreling about borders, administrative borders, which were there, will be now borders of every country. And that's what happened. Okay. Well, and of course, we... basically, you can say that this is a colonial problem. Because imagine all the colonial powers, Spain, Britain, 
Portugal had a seaborne empire. The Netherlands yes. also. Yeah. And if you talk about Indonesia, uh, Netherlands, or India, it's still very painful for us. And what you see now is the process of the Russian empire, always expanding by land in Asia and in Europe, is now more or less in a decolonization process and falling apart. And for a lot of Russians, this is, of course, very painful. And in what sense? Well, it's, it's of course, a, a sense of um, what happened with our, us, with our beautiful empire, what happened with our status in the world as Soviet Union, as the equal of the United States, what happened with, with, with our national pride. And especially for Putin, this is highly important because he told, uh, he, once he said, well, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union is the biggest disaster uh, of the 20th century for mm -hmm. the Russian Empire or for Russia. Not Stalin, not World War II, no, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So that's important. Okay, because um, maybe we can um, have a look at some of these um, uh, examples you mentioned in more detail later. Okay. Um, Putin had a, a speech on February 21st, uh, mm. yeah, sort of at the beginning of, of the war, yeah. in which he also uh, um, yeah, included a lot of historical references, um, yeah. one of them being that uh, the Ukraine and Russia are, are one people. Um, yeah. Well, you already uh, yeah. made a comparison kind of with a colonial power that is now decolonizing. Yeah. Uh, the point is, of course, that many, country ca many countries came into existence by this way, as Ukraine does, of did. Mm -hmm. So to say that this part of Russia is very easy, and it's, it's a, a, a view which is highly contested by Russian and Ukrainian, of course, Ukrainian, but also by Russian historians. It's a very one-sided opinion. Ukraine was, had a separate language. Normally, in normal times, in Soviet times, it was no problem if you spoke Ukrainian or Russian. People could understand each other. It's a, you can compare it with German and uh, Dutch. That's the best comparison. Okay. They, they understood each other, no problem. But of course, when um, there uh, came into existence a kind of national Ukrainian feeling, then you are going to promote your Ukrainian language. And of course, what you see now in Ukraine is that they are promoting the language and uh, take the president Zelensky. Mm -hmm. uh, when he was born, he was a native Russian speaker. Yeah, native Russian speaker. And later on, he learned Ukrainian. So you see, uh, there's also a development in Ukraine itself regarding the language. And also, we, the identity is very much Ukrainian, I guess. Uh, also, for Zelensky, yeah, they are now they are now going to underline, of course, thanks to the activities of Mr. Putin, they are going to underline their Ukrainian ship. With, with, of course, in language, but also in other things. Yeah, they so want uh, that is <laughs> they that want has, not to be Russian. <laughs> yeah, and he has only encouraged that to become stronger. That sentiment now. Exactly. Okay. Um, I think uh, another question would be um, uh, the importance of, of Kiev for the uh, for the Russian Empire as it was maybe or as Putin sees it now. Um, uh, and I think it was also in that speech that he mentioned it was the cradle of uh, Slavic culture. Mm. Um, can you say something about the importance of, of Kiev? Yeah, Kiev is called the mother of all Russian cities. So it's it's uh, it's it's seen as the the first center, and of course it, it was in Kievan Rus that one accepted Christianity, Orthodox Christianity. Okay. Okay. But the, the the curious thing is that the Grand Prince then was called Vladimir in Russian, but in texts in the Nestor Chronicle, he's named Volodymyr which is Ukrainian, of course, that you see in the early Russian text, there you see already the, the difference between Ukrainian and Russian. So it basically, it is a part of Slavic culture, Slavic history, Russian history, Ukrainian history, Belarusian history. Mm -hmm. It's a common part, but no more than that. 
but uh, different from the Russian, of course. Okay, and, and is there a reason why he seems so set now on, on conquering Kiev in particular? Yeah, I can now let's name it Ukraine. Um, okay. I think he, um, Putin has hit in his study a painting of Tsar Nicholas I, not the second, the last one, no, the first, Nicholas I. And Nicholas I was the, the Tsar of the Crimean War in the 19th century. And uh, he was always thinking in buffer zones. So Putin thinks in buffer zones, basically a 19th century thinking. And as okay. well with our modern thinking about sovereignty of a state. So uh, Putin thinks in terms as Russia is a big power and a big power has the right to have buffer zones because uh, he mistrusts the West. Uh, and in normal time, in, uh, in our view, that's not, not bullshit, but that's not our thinking. We say, okay, sovereignty of a country is the highest thing. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you can not, uh, easy, you cannot, uh, for what reason ever, uh, try to conquer another country because you think you have, a, 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 you are entitled to do so. That's, that, it's impossible in international justice. So you have uh, two views, two world views, two views regarding superpower or and buffer zones and yeah. uh, sovereignty uh, colliding with each other. That's what's happening. And in which you say Putin based uh, his strategy actually on the strategy that was uh, in place during the yeah, time during, of the Tsars. Yeah, Nico, especially Nicholas III, who calls, who chose for Russia for a kind of well, to separate himself from the West, to isolate Russia, uh, to say, well, Russia is uh, an entity on its own and it doesn't need the West, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what you see now, Russia isolating himself, itself. And Putin is the champion of that at the moment. Look at uh, look what's, what's happened to Russia if you proclaim, which happened, uh, that all the countries of the EU are basically unfriendly countries. Mm -hmm. So all the inhabitants are not friendly regarding Russia, which is, of course, a bit crazy. And that way you try to separate the West and Russia. That's what's happening. And you do that by creating buffer, buffer zones. Yeah, and also other thinking, uh, saying, well, okay, we Russians, you don't understand us. That's what the West doesn't understand Russia. Russia is the victim, victim blaming. And uh, there is a cancel culture regarding Russia, etc., etc. Et so everyone blames Russia. We are actually the victim of this. And the West is always aggressive. And Putin says then, of course, NATO is expanding, etc., etc., etc. That story. Yeah, maybe, maybe this is time to talk about that a little bit more, um, because there were also questions about this. Um, from from students as well. Um, if I if I bring down that question because it was a long introduction, also referring to a lecture by John Mearsheimer that maybe you are familiar with. Uh, yes. um, but um, do you think that um, the Ukrainian sorry Ukrainian membership in NATO represents a real threat to Russia, or is it simply a convenient justification for the uh, invasion for Putin? The point is, the Kremlin elite at this moment thinks that this is a real threat for Russia. And why is that? Uh, during the last uh, three years, mm -hmm. Putin has cleansed the elite. So all the old friends uh, whom he knew from St. Petersburg and who, who, who could tell him the truth are dismissed. So there is a new elite mostly from the class of Siloviki. Sil is the Russian word for power. So these are people from the power ministries. That's the army, secret service, etc. And they are hardliners. They are hawks. And it's not about friendship with, with Putin. It's about loyalty. You have to do what the boss says. And this group is particularly hawkish at the moment. And they consider the West as a threat, a mortal threat even. And they say, okay, NATO is expanding 
and NATO tells us uh, it's only defensive. And then they are coming, of course, with uh, examples like Kosovo or Iraq, where NATO was uh, indeed offensive. And their uh, conclusion is it can also happen in Russia. And is it also um, uh, the case that, of course, NATO has, has moved eastwards throughout the, the last decades, closer to Russia? That's, and, a, that's a problem. Yes. Basically, basically, for them, especially the entry of the Baltic states in NATO, because the Baltic states were part of the Soviet Union, and uh, the Baltic states are very close to, for instance, St. Petersburg. That's considered to be a mortal threat by this part of the Russian elite. Yes. Yeah. So, to what extent uh, does Putin actually have a, a point there? Uh, in, that, in that agreement, there were perhaps what, not. What, much. what What I think is that you, we cannot deny that he has the right to think this this way. Okay, yeah. they, they, you, that's, that's, so we have to address this problem. The West should talk with Putin seriously about his thinking and, and about this, um, you know, this idea. And uh, unfortunately, we, have, we had a NATO-Russia Council after uh, Kosovo in 1998. So there was a NATO-Russia uh, Council, but it's not working. So we have the need to develop concrete measures for common security. Why was this council created or what was its purpose? Well, after, after 1998, uh, Russia felt, uh, well, it was uh, humiliate, humiliated. And as a sort of gesture, NATO created in, together with Russia this council because they wanted to get in, to stay in contact with Russia. But in practice, it, uh, it didn't function very well. And now it's almost dead. So okay. you have to revive it and you have to restart the, this discussion. Do you see uh, a, possi a possible positive outcome if that will happen? Well, I think Zelensky already did some, uh, some concessions. Uh, don't forget uh, NATO membership is in the, U in the Ukrainian uh, constitution. I don't you wish to have that. Mm -hmm. uh, but now uh, I, he already said, okay, it's possible, uh, Ukrainian neutrality, but Putin is asking for disarmament, which is completely different. And disarmament is, of course, for Ukraine unacceptable, because you see what happens now. <laughs> there is yeah. an invasion and you cannot disarm if, you, if, if your neighbor is aggressive. Yeah, so... The requests at this point don't seem very feasible. At this moment, I think uh, both uh, opinions are, uh, well, there's not much room for a compromise at this moment. Okay. I see we have some questions coming in um, in the chat as well. Uh, let me just have a look. Um... Maybe this is an interesting one. It's a, uh, someone who says I'm from Bulgaria, where 60% of people support uh, Putin religiously and the other 30% hate him. How can I convince people who support him that he is in fact not saving the world from the West? Which is the narrative in, in Bulgaria. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. But um, what I would do is to point at the structure of the Russian state at this moment and the absolute lack of uh, press freedom. So there is no diversification in the press. It's only state propaganda. And how can you support a state where if you are on the street with a, a, a white uh, piece of paper to put it uh, as a sort of, of order and you put it in front of you that you, get, you can get a, a prison sentence for 15 years how can you, can you defend such a state? That's almost impossible. And then I'm not talking about the judiciary in Russia, which is absolutely not uh, independent. So I can imagine that you think, okay, they are orthodox people and which they are in Russia, but in Ukraine, they are also orthodox as in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, another point is of course, that uh, if you look at the Bulgarian-Russian relations, 
in the 19th century, it was not always top. <laughs> there were a lot. There was a lot of uh, mistrust on either side. So, so one of the problems seems to be in both countries that there is no room at all for any any kind of free press. Is that correct to say? In in, in Russia, in Ukraine, there is a free press. Yeah. But what I would do if I had had to uh, to make clear that you shouldn't support Russia is to simply to point out what kind of uh, situation regarding human rights there is in Russia. That's enough. And uh, would people believe that? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Is that, is perhaps, that... perhaps, perhaps they know people who live in Russia and who can tell the story, of course. Yeah. Yeah, once words gets out or soldiers come back to Russia, I've, I've yeah, that's as well also, then. That, yeah, that's also a, a, a problem, so soldiers coming back, because perhaps you know the example of Russian soldiers coming back from the wars against Napoleon and also against Stalin, especially... Uh, what happened there? Uh, after the Second World War, well, imagine uh, soldiers were coming back and had fought uh, for years and immediately placed, were placed in campments because Stalin mistrusted them because they knew uh, too much about the West. So the, the, what, what the Russian government now wants is isolation. Isolation uh, of uh, soldiers coming back? Yeah, I think so, because if the stories leak out what's really happening in Ukraine, that's directly contra the propaganda from the Kremlin. Which is, of course, this is only some kind of military action to help Russian people, et cetera, et cetera. And we are not targeting civilians, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's directly opposite against uh, the, the narrative of the Kremlin propaganda. And do you think because, of course, we now uh, when you compare it to your previous examples, live in a way more digital age, that it's still possible to keep these things secret? Uh, yeah, but Russia is doing a lot to, for instance, block Facebook or Instagram, etc. So it's it's more difficult, and it's also a generational thing, because <clears throat> the older generation in uh, Russia mostly supports Putin. Why? Putin is the anti-Yeltsin. Well, you remember, or you perhaps heard from Yeltsin. Yeltsin was the president in the 90s, uh, very uh, incapable of governing the country, mostly drunk, uh, a shame for the country. Putin is the opposite. Uh, you can say many bad things of him, but not he, he's not a drunk. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, during the first 14 years, until, the, until Crimea, there was a kind of social contract. And the kind of the social contract was, you, Alexandra or Ivan, common Russian people, you don't mix up with politics, but you will get more money. And therefore, you will have it economically better. Okay, and a lot of people still believe that message, especially the older generation who, who uh, were witness of the of the destruction of the Soviet Union yeah. and afterwards the collapse of Russia in the 90s, economic yeah. collapse. Yeah. And of course, they are afraid for, of something like that happening again. Yeah, uh, and uh, the argument is, you know what you have and you don't know what you will get regarding Putin. OK, Putin is perhaps not the best, but perhaps is uh, the one who follows, follows him that can be uh, even worse. Yeah, so they prefer the status quo in that respect. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. okay. Um, some more questions coming in. Um, we're jumping a little bit between topics, but um, you mentioned before the, the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union. Uh, and there's a question um, why it is the case that um, uh, when the USSR was dissolved, most former Eastern Soviet um, Republic was taken as allies by the West, mm. uh, but not Russia. Why, why is this the case? Um, because these countries, um, of course, when the, they got rid of the uh, Soviet regime, which was, of course, a dictatorship uh, for, uh, for all of them. And imagine Polish history is a drama, is a drama, because they had a lot of trouble uh, with, with Russia. The same for Hungary, the same for Czechoslovakia, 
etc., etc. So these countries were very glad when the, the West accepted them in NATO. There was a discussion, why shouldn't we accept uh, Russia for this? And in the 90s, uh, Russia was against it because Russia said, we are too big for this. And after 2002, in 2002 and four, Putin suggested to do this. I'm not yet pretty sure who torpedoed this, but imagine, uh, of course, Putin wanted a, a safety structure, and he called it always from Lisbon to Vladivostok, one safety okay. structure. And I think there was a lot of opposition from the Americans after 2002 against this idea. And perhaps one is one can say, if Russia had been in NATO and Ukraine perhaps also, mm -hmm. then it, the trouble would be less than now. Uh, you can compare it with Greece and Turkey also not the best friends, but okay, they managed to, survive, to uh, live together. Yeah, so it's so in a sort of alternative reality. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. And that's, that's also the idea why in Brussels, a lot of people, a lot of politicians and decision makers say, for instance, to the Balkans, which is also a powder cake potentially, well, uh, give that, uh, that countries, give these countries a, a, a a uh, place in uh, the, uh, in the EU or, and or NATO, because then they are together in a sort of common organization and then we can discuss problems. So. Okay, and, yeah, and um, in, in general, how big is the influence of the West on uh, these um, former Soviet um, countries? I think- Like the, Ukraine. Yeah, in, in Ukraine, the influence of the West is, is, of course, big, it's big, but don't forget, and now, of course, we have forgotten about Poland and Hungary, but in Brussels, before the invasion, uh, before the war with Ukraine, uh, in Brussels, one was not very satisfied with Hungary and Poland, mm -hmm. because they tried, well, of course, they, they were, uh, they, all, they introduced all kinds of laws were, which were basically against press freedom or freedom of the judiciary. So we had our own problems with, with these countries. I, I can imagine also with, with Ukraine and corruption in the past, right? Yeah, but Ukraine is not a part of, is, is only an associated member of the EU. Yep. And that means that you, uh, well, in future, in, in further, in, in, but no one knows when you can be a member. But uh, look at Turkey. Turkey became an associate member of the EU in 1965. Now we are 50 years later and it's still no member, not a member. So uh, an associated membership doesn't mean that you will become a member automatically. No, and what, and that... what we have seen with Poland and Hungary is we accept everything you ask and when they are member, well, they are going to uh, to quarrel about values, which is Brussels proclaiming. Okay, thanks. Um, let's talk a bit about the, the strategy that is now in place to um, try and end this war. The sanctions, for example, um, mm -hmm. quite a few questions about sanctions as well. Um, what, what is your view on them? Do you think they could be effective? Uh, in the sense that uh, it will be much harder um, for the regime to convince people in Russia that this is the right track. Uh, what you see now is that uh, we are now in a war, in, uh, we have a war now for five weeks, almost five weeks, and inflation in Russia is up almost uh, 25, 30 percent. Mm -hmm. So a ruble is falling. Uh, it's very difficult for people to get around. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, all, uh, it was already difficult because most uh, Russians spent half of their income buying foods. So it was already difficult. But now life is getting more difficult. On the other hand, uh, in the West, one forgets mostly that Russians are used to hardships. They could go to the dacha. They uh, cultivate their own crops. 
and tomatoes and cucumbers. Com they uh, rely on friends and family. So they are used to uh, nah, the difficulties and to survive. And they are tougher than in the West, probably, the <laughs> people in the West. Yeah, yeah, they, they are less uh, easily uh, blown from their feet, so to say, Ex exactly. blown off their feet. Yeah. Exactly, and they, uh, of course, they, um, they are used to, well, to think about the state, well, we cannot expect anything from the state or from the Kremlin, so we will support ourselves. Because so they're... yes, changes are important. Yes, they are hurting. Uh, and uh, but perhaps, um, well, the hope is, of course, that it will hurt parts of the Russian elite. Yeah, and there, there are and... questions about that. Indeed, are the oligarchs uh, feeling these sanctions? Of course, they are feeling this. Because about um, the point is that uh, in, in Russia and in the Soviet Union, you can be an oligarch and on paper very rich, but it doesn't mean anything because what you possess, you can lose immediately. That was in Soviet times and it's also in, uh, in the time of Putin. With one strike of the pen, you can lose everything. So, uh, and of course they don't want that. Uh, and therefore that it's possible, but the oligarchs are not the most important part of the elite now. It's the Siloviki, so the people from the power departments. Okay, that you mentioned power earlier. This, this which I meant earlier, yeah. yeah. Fairly newly re uh, installed. Um, no, they, they were always there, but it's, yeah. now, it's now the dominant uh, factor in the elite. And uh, how do the sanctions impact uh, that group? Well, they are all they are also rich, but you have to think on other things. For instance, their children cannot study abroad anymore. That's one thing. Of course, they will lose some possessions, but um, that's not the most important thing. Uh, so, uh, well, they they feel it in their families, uh, and we will see what happens. But at the end, um, I think it's about common sense. Is this wise to continue the war? And as long as they think uh, we can do this because uh, we can uh, uh, we can achieve our goals, then the war will continue. So, if the sanctions are not um, uh, hurting them enough, so to say, mm. then they they will yeah, just yeah. That's that's I think uh, that's real. But because they they know the whole world is hating us. And uh, as they depicted, we are we are fighting for our survival. And do you think that uh, because NATO uh, at the moment um, is uh, not providing um, actual, I mean, they're providing military assistance, mm. but they're not going to war themselves? No. Um, do not you think yet. that's a, a wise decision at this point? What could, the other, uh, what could we do otherwise? Because otherwise we have World War Three. So, but on the other hand, don't forget that there is massive transport of weaponry to uh, to uh, Ukraine. And already in the second week of the war, almost twenty thousand anti-tank guns were sent to Ukraine. Twenty thousand, and you know that the the chance of a hit of a javelin rocket, which is an anti-tank rocket, mm -hmm. is ninety-six percent. And it, you can use it at a distance of four kilometers. So imagine you are a Ukrainian soldier. At a distance of four kilometers, you see a Russian tank and you can use your javelin rocket with a, with a, a chance of success of 96%. Well, poor Russians in such a tank because you, make no, you have no chance to survive this. So on the other hand, okay, NATO is not actively military engaged but it is sending lots of modern equipment, easily to use, easy to use, which can tip the scale of the war, the balance of the war. Okay, because Russia cannot match that um, exactly. kind of uh, artillery. Or... Yeah, and uh, the Russian military performance is poor because of lack of communications. So they have only one third of the radios and walkie talkies which they need. Um, they mostly need open sources for that. 
uh, they are also poorly uh, equipped. So with old tanks, T-72, uh, 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 updated, okay, but not very modern, etc., etc. And uh, what also important is, is still after almost five weeks of war, uh, the Russian Air Force still don't have total uh, total uh, dom domination, domination. domination uh, of the Ukrainian skies. So there is still a Ukrainian Air Force active, which is unbelievable. Yeah, I think the progress, uh, people had anticipated Russia would make more progress at this point. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And it's more or less amateuristic what you see now. Okay. And uh, of course, questions as well in the chat about uh, the prospects of uh, a possible nuclear war. Uh, I'm sure you've given this a lot of thought as well, but what are your expectations there? Yeah, the, the point is that uh, using nuclear weapons is uh, defined differently in the Russian military strategy than in the Western. In the Western military strategy is completely ruled out uh, unless there is a nuclear attack. In the Russian military strategy, uh, to use a small type nuclear weapon is allowed. So that's the, the, the source of uh, our concerns. But if you do that, of course, it ex escalates totally because then NATO have to uh, be active military. I cannot imagine that Brussels would do nothing if a, nuclear, a small type nuclear bomb was thrown at Kharkiv, for example. Now you can you cannot do you cannot sit idle then. That's impossible. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a few minutes left. Time is flying, of course. Um, there are people who would like to know if you think. Um, there could be uh, a revolution in Russia itself, um, like the revolution in Ukraine had in 2013, the Euromaidan. Um, do you think there's yeah. any chance of this materializing in Russia? It's maybe always, among the younger uh, younger yeah, population. It's always possible, but I'm not optimistic about that, and it has a reason. Um, common Russians always tell me we had so many revolutions in our history. And at the end, uh, we were worse off. It, it didn't make things better, it made things worse. For instance, the communist revolution of 1917 or uh, what happened in 1991. For most Russians, it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. So okay. they, are, they are tired of revolutions. <laughs> also, the younger people who have yeah, but, less but emotion. Of, yes, okay. But a lot of the younger ones already fled the country. The, right. the top young, the top, the bright minds from the young generation already left. So, no, yeah. I'm not optimistic about the revolution. It has to come from a division within the uh, elite itself. Yeah. So, uh, so the pro yeah, the protest should come from within. Is what you're saying in a, yeah, exactly. in a and is it likely that that uh, will happen? I am a, a poor historian. I'm not a poor to cook style. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I, don't a fair question, yeah. I don't know. But at the end, I think this is unbearable as it is now. And you know, it can happen, happen very fast. It can happen very fast. You mean uh, uh, from within? Yeah, from within, yeah. or, a, or a re, even a revolution can happen very fast. A, a look at the February Revolution in 1917, which was basically a hunger revolution. And it swept away in a few days, uh, 300 years of uh, Tsarism. It is possible. It is possible. I'm afraid there are quite a few more questions that, that require some of your forecasting uh, abilities. <laughs> um, <laughs> but maybe in a very general sense, even if the war uh, would stop tomorrow, what, what do you think will happen with Russia um, at this point? And this person I, says, I, personally, I see a new Cold War era. I think that's uh, that's the main concern at this moment that there will be a new Cold War, and uh, I think if the war stops tomorrow or in a month or etc., there will be a massive uh, help program for Ukraine, and there will be nothing for Russia. I think yeah. everything will be on its place. All these sanctions and all these uh, problems with international payments and travel etc. etc. So uh, for Russia, nothing will change things will stay miserable and Ukraine, okay, it will get massive help from the West. 
from IMF and the World Bank, etc., and development banks, etc. So that's quite a bleak outlook for for the the common Russian people. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, well, we're in the final minutes. I'm trying to kind of maybe get to a yes or no answer. question. <laughs> yes or no question. Uh, do you think Russia is planning on invading more countries than just Ukraine? Uh, no, I don't think so because uh, um, it has well, it has now. Uh, so, uh, it has se uh, severe difficulties with its army. Uh, and w w which country could it invade? Finland. Finland is a uh, military strong country. Uh, it didn't diminish its forces after 1991. It has still 22 brigades active. Uh, we have two as the Netherlands. So uh, the, the Finnish are armed until the teeth. So yeah, yeah. no problem. <laughs> And the rest uh, is uh, almost NATO territory. So, and then you have an Article 5 question. And Article 5 of NATO is one attack, uh, an, an, an attack on one of our members is an attack on all. So then it's a NATO question. Russia will not do that. No, you think uh, Putin is still sensitive to these fairly rational arguments that you are putting forward? Yeah, because he's military weak at this moment. What, what the Ukraine war demonstrated is that the, the level of perfection of the Russian army is rather low. So, answer is no. No, okay. Then maybe final question. Um, you already mentioned that, well, the outlook for Russia is quite bleak, even if the war would stop. Um, what would be the, the best outcome for Russia at this point? Regime change. Uh, start on, on what happened uh, after Gorbachev, uh, a, a total new beginning, and the West and Russia on the table, and let's discuss everything, and also the lifting of sanctions, of course. And that's it, that's what, with, which Russia could have, with, have, could happen with Russia, yes. So that means uh, someone would overthrow Putin from within or outside? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, well, Hans, I can only say thank you for addressing these. Uh, there were a lot of different points that we discussed. I, I hope there was some consistency um, from my point, but there were so many questions about different topics that, um, of course, we've just yeah, been able to cover um, some of the aspects that are uh, at play at this very complex uh, crisis. Um, but for now, Hans, thank you very much for joining us today and um, for sharing your experience uh, with us. And of course, to everyone in the chat for um, joining us with the many questions. Thank you so much. Of course, we'll all be following uh, the war as it goes on, and we all hope for a good outcome uh, in the end. With all pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Hans, and um, everyone at home. We hope to see you again uh, on campus, maybe tomorrow or on Thursday for one of the other Student Generale programs. Really? Bye. All right. Bye bye.